show your support. Follow me on Twitter. Hello, I am That British Guy and welcome back to The Raw After. In this video we will be looking at the episode of Raw after Unforgiven 2008. The pay-per-view with three championship scramble matches. Anybody else remember those? I remember at the time kind of actually quite liking them, but they pretty much dropped them straight away after this. I think there might have been one other occasion where they used it for maybe one of the belts, but on this night in Unforgiven, the world title, the WWE title and the ECW title, yes that was around at the time, they were all on the line in a 20-25 minute match and basically whoever had the belt at the end was declared the official winner. And the previous night, CM Punk's world title changed hands even though he wasn't in the match. He was taken out and Chris Jericho replaced him after a brutal match against Shawn Michaels. And he came out as the last competitor in the championship scramble for the world title and won. And this is how we open up this episode of Monday Night Raw. Jericho comes out to the ring with the belt and kind of just runs through his evening, shall we say. He first of all mentions Shawn Michaels and the brutal match that they had. He shows off some war wounds from that match, cuts and bruising and welts all over his back, mainly from Shawn Michaels' belt. And he asks what kind of a man would do this to another human being. This being only a couple of months since he smashed Shawn Michaels' head through a television screen and accidentally punched Shawn Michaels' wife in the face for realsies, busting her lip. Oops. So yes, he shows off his war wounds from the night before and very much putting over the brutality that Shawn Michaels dealt him. But he says that was a non-sanctioned match, so... In the record books, it doesn't actually count. So, what did Shawn Michaels actually achieve? Nothing. Whereas, what did I achieve? Well, I won this and holds up the world title. This opening bit here goes on way, way too long. And he is finally interrupted by Raw General Manager. Can you guess? Mike Adamley. Yes, hands up who forgot he was Raw General Manager. <laughs> he briefly congratulates Chris Jericho, but he does let him know that CM Punk will get his rematch because he never actually officially properly lost the belt. He will get his rematch on the following week's Raw in a steel cage match. Jericho doesn't have an issue with this, and he's about to leave and kind of be on his way. But Mike Adamley says, no, 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 no. Last night I did you a favour and put you in that world title match, so tonight you are going to do me a favour and make sure that we get a very, very decent main event. You are going to be facing Batista who was this close to winning the world title the night before and is understandably rather cheesed off with Jericho. So that is going to be our main event for the night and Jericho, as you can probably imagine, is not best pleased. So, 25 minutes in, we get our first match, finally. And it is a title match for the women's title. Yes, that did still exist at the time. And contrary to what was said at WrestleMania 32, Charlotte was not the first women's champion. Anyway, we have the champion Beth Phoenix taking on the ex-champion Mickey James. And this is Mickey James's rematch from her title loss at SummerSlam. Her and the then Intercontinental Champion Kofi Kingston faced off against Beth Phoenix and Santino Morella, Glamorella, for both of the titles in a winner take all match, and they both lost. So this is Mickey James trying to get her belt back. 
It's a pretty decent match, goes about sort of seven, eight minutes. There are a couple of minor botchy moments in it, but you could lift this match from this episode and plonk it into next week's episode of Raw, and it would not feel out of place at all. I mean, of course it obviously would. It's Beth Phoenix versus Mickey James. Unfortunately, at the time, they were very much in the minority in terms of performers on the women's roster, so you didn't get to see this kind of match all too often. But it's very nice to see it here. Watching the match as well is Candice Michelle, who came back the previous week and won a battle royal to declare herself the number one contender. She got put on the shelf for a little while thanks to Beth Phoenix. So she is kind of scouting this match just to see who she will be facing for the women's title. And also it is important to note that because of Santino Morella, Beth Phoenix is on a little bit of a losing streak of late, so he is nowhere to be seen in this match. He's basically said, look, I don't need you, I don't want you helping me in my matches, stay away, I will do this on my own. So as I said, they have a very, very nice sort of seven, eight minute match, ending with an Alabama slam as Mickie James kind of gets caught up on the top rope. Beth Phoenix gets her into an Alabama slam position, slams her down and kind of stacks her up for a matchbook style cover and retains the belt. She will be facing off against Candice Michelle at the next pay-per-view. We get a brief little skit backstage between Jamie Noble and Layla. Basically, Layla's thinking that Jamie Noble is a little bit of a loser because he lost to William Regal the other week. But he is kind of determined to prove her wrong and asks her to accompany him out to the ring. And she does so. This leads on to a one-on-one -on -one match between Jamie Noble and William Regal with Layla kind of watching at ringside. Incidentally, William Regal is our very newly crowned King of the Ring, I believe beating CM Punk in the final. And this was kind of the second revival of that after King Booker won the King of the Ring a couple of years ago. We would then have to wait a little while for Sheamus to win it in a few years and then Wade Barrett in 2015 before obviously seeing King Corbin prevail earlier this year. Jamie Noble is pretty much immediately snuffed out here by a very aggressive William Regal. Jamie Noble kind of tries to put in some kind of a comeback, but William Regal hits him with a running knee attack and pins him very, very convincingly. He then gets out of the ring and kind of holds his arm out for Layla, who very kind of reluctantly and confusingly kind of takes his arm and walks up the ramp with him. The look on her face says she doesn't really want to go, but it also says that she's kind of mesmerised by him somehow. They don't really explain this on commentary. He doesn't threaten her, so it's not like she's being coerced into taking his arm. He doesn't grab her in any way and kind of lead her off, which may have made a bit more sense. He just holds his arm out, she takes hold of it, and he leads her up the aisle way. She takes one last look at Jamie Noble in the ring before leaving with William Regal. Very odd performance here, whether this was just dodgy axing or they just didn't explain the storyline. Not really sure. JBL is in a match next. Yes, he was on Raw at the time. I forgot that as well. Anyway, he has a match up next against CHL. Who the hell is CHL? Why, it is Charlie Haas Layfield who is going through a bit of kind of mimicking other superstars shtick at the moment. He did a version of John Cena a couple of weeks ago and I believe the previous week he did a Charlito. Not Carlito, Charlito. So here he is locked in the trunk so he has to get let out of the trunk of the car or the boot of the car if we're to use the correct term. And he does the whole JBL shtick. 
I'm a big loudmouth Texan who lives in New York City and I'm rich and I'm better than you. Shtick all the way to the ring. He's decked out exactly the same as JBL and there are huge CHL chants from the crowd when he explains who he is. The match starts and JBL just kind of looks at him is absolutely disgusted that he is being mocked and mimicked in this way and leaves the ring he gets counted out chl is your winner and celebrates like he has just won the royal rumble backstage batista and kelly kelly are having a bit of a laugh about that match at jbl's expense when he comes up to the pair of them kelly kelly just kind of morphs off okay and jbl and batista have a little bit of an exchange jbl sort of saying look we don't like each other but we've got professional respect for each other we're both former champions we've both kind of headlined pay-per-views we've even headlined SummerSlam together we're main event guys we shouldn't have people like charlie haas mocking main event guys you should understand that like you can't put Charlie Haas on the same kind of level as me and Batista says look yeah you guys are nothing alike at all Charlie Haas actually won his match today and JBL leaves very very annoyed <laughs> needless to say this may play into things later on earlier in the video I mentioned ECW and they are in full force here. At the time there was a Raw and ECW kind of exchange agreement. Kind of almost like a wild card I guess. But because we had general managers there was kind of a bit of structure to it. And because ECW was kind of more the developmental brand. It gave those guys a bit of a bigger stage to perform on. And against kind of a bigger and better roster. And then some of the Raw guys would go over to ECW to kind of inject a bit of star power into that, that brand, those shows and those matches effectively. And this next match is very much got an ECW flavour. The Miz and John Morrison, the former tag team champions from ECW at the time, are facing off against Rey Mysterio, who has just returned from a bit of a hiatus. And he is teaming up with Evan Bourne, who is also on the ECW brand. But before the match, we get a quick interview with Rey Mysterio, kind of saying, look, I'm back now. I came back at Unforgiven and I'm feeling great. Yes, I have been attacked recently by Kane. He thinks I'm going to be a victim of his. No way, that is not happening. I will kind of go face to face with Kane and we will sort this out but for now tag team match so at this stage of his career Miz very much is not awesome he is in weird kind of longish denim shorts not quite John Cena length but that sort of length he's got the hat with the hair mohawky thing through it he's got the chick magnet t-shirt he's got boring generic music it's the kind of Miz that you need to kind of forget that that was ever part of his career to be honest I very much like the Miz now not so much as a face but that's another story for another time but this period of the Miz yeah, best left kind of in the archives shall we say I guess it kind of worked with John Morrison but mm, maybe not there is an early working over of Rey Mysterio and then he gets kind of a hot tag and there's a bit of a mini flurry from Evan Bourne including a dive over the top rope, not into a suicide dive but into a hurricanrana spot on John Morrison on the outside. Very nice to see that, especially in 2008. I still kind of miss Evan Bourne in WWE. I know obviously we have Matt Seidel, but I don't really get to see much of him, to be honest. I did very much like Evan Bourne, and it's a shame he is no longer part of the company. 
So yes, now Evan Bourne is in, it's his time to sell like a maniac and be worked over by Miz and Morrison, constantly cutting off the ring. Typical heel tactics for this tag team. They were tag champions for about eight months, so they've got this chemistry well in the bag. But lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, there is another hot tag to Rey Mysterio. He manages to finally hit the 619 on, I believe it's John Morrison. Tags in Evan Bourne, who hits a beautiful looking shooting star press, and he picks up the win. Kane then appears on the Titan Tron, basically as an answer to Ray's earlier interview, and sets up a one on one match between the two of them for next week. And he holds up his old mask with kind of a crack through it, it's kind of three quarters of his mask effectively. He holds that up as some kind of symbolic gesture and Ray looks a little bit worried in the ring. We then get a quick recap of the attack on CM Punk from last night, partially explaining why he wasn't in the title match and why he doesn't have his belt anymore, but mainly kind of getting over the attack from Randy Orton and the other three guys that would become Legacy, Cody Rhodes, Ted DiBiase and Manu, who debuted the previous night. Basically at this time the other three guys are trying to kind of put themselves over in the eyes of Randy Orton and show that they are on his level and they are as important as him and obviously with the link of the Hall of Fame fathers that they all have. After the recap Orton comes out to the ring. Now he is still sporting an injury to his shoulder. He actually broke his collarbone earlier in the year and had to relinquish the WWE title, I believe it was. And that's basically why he is saying he attacked Punk. He's kind of just trying to get his vengeance out there. And he says that Jericho should be thanking Orton because if it wasn't for him, he wouldn't have even been in that match. And this by no means makes the two of them friends and he will be hunting down Jericho at the earliest opportunity and getting a world title back around his waist. So yes, just because they're heels doesn't mean they're aligned in any way. I didn't really do you a favour Jericho, but you should really be thanking me. I didn't do it for you and for you to get a chance. So as soon as I'm fit and healthy, I will be hunting you down. And he is basically putting over that he is the sole reason why CM Punk was taken out of that match and why Chris Jericho was put into it. And that is when the other three guys come out and they are not too happy about this because they were the ones that initially attacked CM Punk. And when Kofi Kingston comes in to try and save CM Punk, they were the three that beat Kofi Kingston away, allowing... Orton the opportunity to punt CM Punk in the head. And Rhodes explains this to Orton, like, it wasn't all you, we first attacked Punk and then we held Kofi at bay, so give us some props for what happened. Manu then takes the mic and says, yeah, you're not so great, Randy, yeah, you've got a Hall of Fame father, well, we've got fathers that are Hall of Famers as well. Ted DiBiase then brings up the fact that last week, Orton disrespectfully slapped Cody Rhodes and just as he manages to get those words out of his mouth Randy Orton slaps him too and rolls out of the ring and kind of leaves the three of them there fuming. Obviously they can't really do anything to Orton at this point because he is still sporting a broken bone. He just kind of scarpers and makes his way up the ramp. They have a six man tag team match against Crime Time and Kofi Kingston. Obviously Kofi Kingston wanting a little bit of vengeance for the night before and Crime Time were in a tag team title match against Rhodes and DiBiase the previous night and they were able to retain their belts against Crime Time no thanks to Manu's interference. And it is important to say that this version of Kofi Kingston is the Jamaican version of Kofi Kingston. Still... <laughs> This is uh, pretty much a condensed version of the tag match that we got earlier. We get the isolation of Kofi Kingston. 
He manages to tag in Shad, who uses JTG as a bit of a missile to take a few of the guys out. But in the ensuing mayhem, Manu blind tags himself in, jumps Shad from behind and hits him with a kind of lifting, swinging, neck breaker slam and picks up the win. As I said, these three guys, along with Randy Orton, would form Legacy, kind of as a slightly revamped version of Evolution, but nowhere near as good. However, Manu would not last long. Apparently, he was very kind of difficult to work with and had a bad attitude, so they basically bumped him off pretty quickly. Then the whole thing kind of disbanded a few months later. Rhodes and DiBiase were no longer a tag team. And, yeah, then we're kind of just stuck in the mid-card. DiBiase was given Maurice to kind of be his manager and the million dollar belt as kind of trying to push him up towards the upper mid-card, but it never really worked. He was a bit of a charisma vacuum, unfortunately. Obviously, Randy Orton is still about at the top of the card on SmackDown Live, and I'm not really sure what happened to Cody Rhodes. He sort of disappeared from WWE, and he's doing something now, but I'm not quite sure what. Anyway, after that, we have some comedy. Yes, Glamorella are out. Beth Phoenix, the women's champion, and Santino Morella, the intercontinental champion. And Santino Morella brings out the Honkometer. Oh, I loved the Honkometer at the time. He shows up on the screen how many weeks the Honky Tonk Man was the intercontinental champion for. 64 weeks! And now show them how long I have been Intercontinental Champion. Yes, three weeks! He then explains that the Mountie only had the Intercontinental Championship for two days. So he's already 19 times better than the Mountie. And he is basically stating that once he has beaten the Honky Tonk's record of 64 weeks, he will be the greatest intercontinental champion of all the times. Now bring out mine opponent. Mine opponent, yes. Very much confusing Michael Carl and Jerry Lawler because they don't know what an opponent is. Not realising that he said mine instead of my because they're stupid. Anyway, his opponent is Gene Snitsky, or just Snitsky at this point, and he absolutely destroys Santino Morella, throwing him around the ring like he is a cruiserweight. It's very funny to watch. Beth Phoenix gets up on the apron and actually manages to distract Snitsky, to which Santino tries to blindside him and gets destroyed again. Very, very fun to watch. He then manages to kind of get a very, very sneaky roll-up and a quick victory on Snitsky, leaving him fuming in the ring, and Santino celebrating, well, I used the term earlier, I'll use it again, like he just won the Royal Rumble. Our main event is up next, Jericho versus Batista, but before that match, Jericho has a quick conversation with Mike Adamley, who is having a brief conversation with Kelly Kelly. Yes, there she is again for no reason. And as soon as Chris Jericho walks in, she again just disappears. Thanks for coming twice there, Kelly Kelly. Go away. Anyway, Jericho explains to Mike Adamley, look, I'm not a machine. I was in two matches last night. I am broken and beaten. I've got a steel cage match for the world title next week. I can't be in this main event against Batista. I need to go home and rest. Adam Lee explains, look, last night I did you a favour. I gave you an opportunity in that match and you won the world title. Now you need to do me a favour and go out there and give me a good main event for this show. So off you go. As you can expect, Batista completely dominates Jericho throughout this entire match. It only lasts about three minutes or so, and Mike Adamley comes out and kind of puts an end to the match. He says, look, okay, I made a judgment call here, and it went a bit wonky, 
this is not the main event that we need, I need a decent competitive match and this isn't it. So because of that I'm going to give Chris Jericho, who is obviously in a weakened state, I'm going to give him a tag team partner just to try and even things up a bit. And that tag team partner is, can you guess, yes, it's JBL. Good job he had a little bit of interaction with Batista earlier in the night to set this up. Clever that! Anyway, we come back from the commercial break and the match is sort of restarting itself. Jericho is kind of a little bit more into it. He is very much kind of tagging in when JBL is getting on top of Batista. Batista then kind of uses this opportunity to maybe get himself a bit of a foothold in. Jericho tags himself out and Batista gets worked over again by JBL for Jericho to come in and kind of pick up the scraps. It's that kind of structure. Needless to say as well, Lance Cade is on the outside of the ring and he is kind of Jericho's protege at this time. And every time Jericho's kind of being tagged out or thrown outside the ring, he's kind of checking up on him, making sure he's okay. Giving a bit of verbal to Batista, just to kind of add an extra bit of challenge for Batista to overcome. Towards the end of the match, when Jericho is the legal man, it looks like he is going to get absolutely destroyed by a Batista bomb, and Cade interferes here, kind of putting pay to that, and Jericho kind of rolls out to the side of the ring. And while Batista is dealing with Cade, he kind of turns into a clothesline from hell by JBL. Jericho kind of then just crawls over to Batista and steals the victory after JBL did basically all of the work in the match. He picks up his belt and kind of just walks up the ramp, very, very pleased with himself, but clearly beaten and broken. This loss just seems to irritate Batista even more. He spears JBL and he hits a spine buster and Batista bomb to Lance Cade after they tried a bit of a two-on-one beatdown on him, but it very much didn't work. And after destroying Cade, Batista kind of turns to Jericho and looks up the ramp to him as Jericho kind of surveys what happens. But he is very much in the sort of safe zone at the top of the ramp, clutching on to his world title with a smug grin on his face. And that is how we end the episode. From here, Jericho would face Shawn Michaels for the world title at No Mercy. He does retain against CM Punk in the steel cage. I'm not really sure how. Cade might get involved, something like that. I can't quite remember. But yeah, Shawn Michaels will return and kind of reinserts himself into this feud with Chris Jericho but obviously for a world title. And at No Mercy they actually do have a ladder match and it's that match where we get the spot with them both hanging onto one side of the belt each, kind of leaning off the sides of the ladder. Very difficult spot to do because if one hand had slipped inadvertently we could have very much ruined the finish of that match, especially if Shawn Michaels had won and accidentally won the belt. So there we go, that was the Raw After Unforgiven 2008, the one with all the championship scrambles. Doing some nice things here, we got a nice women's title match which then fed into the next programme of Candice vs Beth, which was also then seen at No Mercy. We also build upon the whole Glamorella bit, mainly on the Santino Morella side for the Intercontinental title. We get the kind of further developments of the beginning of Legacy, and those three guys really trying to kind of put themselves over in the eyes of Randy Orton. We're still very much trying to keep JBL and Batista within that main event picture. The Kane and Rey Mysterio storyline furthers into a one-on-one -on -one match, and they have a few matches back and forth in the ensuing weeks. Some more ECW guys getting over in front of a bigger crowd and a bigger kind of TV audience as well. Obviously all of those guys would eventually make their way over to Raw at various different times and are still very heavily involved in the business even though only one of them is still with the company. And yeah, we got CHL and the Honka meter. what more do you need? Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for watching. This is unfortunately my 
final video. There will still be a podcast with Pokey Pidge at the weekend. But, hmm, beyond that, I will say one final farewell on the 30th of September. And after that, that British guy is no more, I'm afraid. But we are getting ahead of ourselves with that. So all I will say is... Thank you very much for watching, and until next time, I've been that British guy, and I will see you very soon. Goodbye.